Today we are taking you to Austin, Texas where our hosts Leanne Valenti and Charlie Rice show us how to entertain in their 700 square foot bungalow. Charlie gives us a quick tour of their home before six of their closest friends arrive for a Japanese style dinner party. It's the first house I bought and it was really rough shape, just tear down shape. Um, and the first thing I did was come in with my dad and we just started tearing down walls and drywall. Um, and it was really a blank canvas, but I knew I wanted to make it a great place to host uh, 10 people, be able to really comfortably host a dinner party, and have a lot of seating in the living room. Meanwhile, Leanne walks us through their menu for the evening from preparing the most delicious dishes. I personally love kale. A lot of people think it's too healthy tasting, but one of my favorite ways to prepare it is to grill it so that it really breaks down the fibers and gives it a nice smokiness to curating the perfect sake sampling. We have a handful of different sake for our friend to try tonight. Um, I love offering sake with um, a dinner because unlike wine, it's low or no acidity and zero tannin. And so it really doesn't require as precise of pairings and sakes go really well with a wide variety of food. So come along with us as Leanne and Charlie pull off a bento style feast in less than four hours. You won't want to miss this. I got carried away telling that story and we only have an hour left. So I'm going to have Charlie come and help me cut these persimmons for the salad. And then um, I'll show you how we do the miso soup and the kale and the salmon. Charlie, if you don't mind. Welcome Homeworthy, I'm Leanne Valenti. And I'm Charlie Rice. And this is our little Austin bungalow. We're actually about to host a dinner party, so we're excited to have you here. And there's loads to do and no time to waste, so come on in and let's get started. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Be sure to visit our website, homeworthy.com, to discover amazing furniture, art, accessories, and more, all handpicked by our editors to help transform your house into a home. All of the items are inspired by the episodes you see here on Homeworthy. Enjoy! All right, we're expecting six of our closest friends here in just a couple hours, and I prepared tonight's menu. It's a Japanese homestyle menu, and I sourced a bunch of beautiful produce from the farmer's market, and I'm excited to take you step-by-step step through how to make a bento-style meal. And while she's doing that, I'm gonna give you a little tour of our home. It's only 768 square feet, but it's designed perfectly to host our closest friends and dinner parties. <music> Well, here we are in the living room. This is the first house I bought, and it was really rough shape, just tear down shape. Um, and the first thing I did was come in with my dad, and we just started tearing down walls and drywall. Um, and it was really a blank canvas, but I knew I wanted to make it a great place to host uh, 10 people, be able to really comfortably host a dinner party, and have a lot of seating in the living room. Um, and one of the first things I did after hiring Avery Cox, my designer, was we went to Round Top and just started shopping around and found some really great antiques. Uh, we found these two uh, safari chairs. They're French and from the 1890s. Um, this funny little bench here with little secret compartments. And then we found those side tables. And then the real piece de resistance was uh, this back bar that's also from the 1890s. And we just knew that would be a really great focal point um, and be able to sneak in a lot of storage. Um, we've got a lot of um, our serverware in there, um, records, cookbooks, and it's, just, it's our bar, and it's really kind of uh, evolved over time. I mean, we added these lights into it, we changed out the wooden shelves for glass shelves. Um, it's just a really great focal point. So this was actually one of the first things I'd picked out in my mind. Um, it's a design by R.W. Uh, guild out of New York um, and in my last apartment I just like really wanted it but it just I couldn't justify buying it for like such a temporary space. The artworks in Matea Perota which was I feel like the art was actually the hardest thing for me to find it just took a lot of we worked with a, a art consultant and just went through I mean hundreds 
of options, just like I did a lot of photoshopping to try to see how they would look. Um, and this is very different than what I thought it was going to be. I thought we were going to go with like a very blue and green colors. And I love that it ended up like kind of this side of the house is all just like these warm red and oranges with little accents of uh, green and blue. And then if you go into the kitchen, it's all like cool blues and uh, greens with little accents of red. So the thing I really got in my head around the size was wanting kind of small furniture. I wanted a big sofa and then kind of modular, small, small pieces. Um, and I feel like I was really fortunate. So my next door neighbor is a really, he's become a very dear friend of us and he's a really great designer. His name is Mark Ashby. And I feel like just like, kind of because the design process took more years than I thought it would be, like I really had a chance to get to know them and they all have like super wild design, like very lots of colors, bold patterns. And I'd say when I started, it was like I was much more muted and just kind of hanging out with them, getting encouragement from them. They really pushed my boundaries and I'm so glad I did. Like every decision they made um, that I kind of felt trepidation on like has worked out so well and made the house just a beautiful piece. I was an engineer. I was a software developer for an oil and gas company. Not in my wheelhouse, but I grew up in a uh, 1920s house in Corpus Christi. My mom had done done it in Art Deco style. So it was all kinds of crazy colors, peaches, light greens, light blues, yellows, pinks. Um, so yeah, a white house was never really an option for me. So we like to set out stuff out here on, on the coffee table. So it's a really easy transition after dinner to kind of get people over into the living room. So we have a couple things of chocolate, some dried fruit, um, and we'll set out some apples and then we'll serve it with tea. And it's just, it's nice to have a, a reason for everybody to come into the living room. It's a little more comfortable than just hanging out, chatting around the, the dinner table. So when I bought the house, uh, the living area was all cut up into smaller rooms. And one of the biggest areas that I really had a say in the design was how the layout was gonna be. And I want, knew I wanted it to be an open floor plan. I knew that would make the space feel bigger and make it easier to host friends. Um, and so directly across from the living room is the dining room, um, which is, I mean, the, kind of the whole concept of my design was to be able to very comfortably host 10 people. I wanted 10 seats around the dining table, at least 10 chairs in the living room. And then we got these super fun uh, pieces off first dibs and um, urban electric lighting. So even before I met Leanne, like I loved cooking. So I had a really uh, strong sense of how I wanted the layout to be. I really, um, one of my best friends, we like cooked and hosted dinner parties all the time. And so I knew that we needed to have plenty of workspace for us. So in my last apartment, it was really small and a lot of open cabinetry. And I was just really tired of looking at all my, all my dishes, all my cookware. So it was really important to me to, me to, to have um, everything kind of tucked away so I don't have to see it all the time. And then because it's such a small space and I have so much stuff in the kitchen, so it's really important to have everything tucked away. Lots of clever storage. We have our spice rack here, just all our spices. Um, and then this was one that my cabinet designers really fought me and told me that it wasn't possible. But we have this pot rack that actually pulls out and just stores a ton of things. Um, and they had to cut kind of the trim at the top because it's just really tight. Um, and then of course we got the panel ready fridge. Um, and then this stove is a, uh, a Chambers. It's from the 1940s. And I actually grew up with one of these in my house in Corpus. Um, and then my sister bought one about five years ago. And it's just got these really great features. It has a, a broiler that I think Land's gonna use later. Um, and a little fry well in the back. Um, it's just like a super cool piece. It's, they're built to last. They're never gonna break down. Really wanted a big island um, with lots of space to prep and then people to sit. I ended up cooking a lot when people are over, so it's nice to have a place where they can sit to watch. Um, and then we, found, we also found these uh, bar stools at Round Top, but they're so fun because they tuck away um, when they're not in use and they just add such a nice little pop of color. <laughs> And then this is the bathroom. Um, and I love having the double shower. Um, just gives you lots of space. <laughs> the way I worked with Avery was really, I would find these like pieces and just be like, 
we need to make this work. And so this was, uh, it's from the 1930s, it's from the Waldorf Historia um, in New York, and they took it out, I found it salvaged online, and it was one of those pieces where I was just like, I bought this, um, let's make this work, and then we kind of designed the rest of the bathroom around it. As you can see, right behind me is the bedroom. Let's go take a look at that while Leanne finishes her prep. This is an armoire from the 1970s. Um, this was a wallpaper I actually had in my old apartment that I just loved. Um, and so we added it back in and then and then this was a little art piece that I got in San Francisco while just like wandering the streets, this little whoop, bison. Yeah, and I guess with that, let's go see what Leanne's up to in the kitchen. To prepare for the dinner party, Leanne and Charlie did their grocery shopping earlier in the week. Okay, we're here at the downtown farmer's market and we're gonna go see what produce we can find and pick up some flowers as well. All right, so I was able to get some of these beautiful Fuyu persimmons from the farmer's market. We were just in Japan and the persimmon trees were loaded with fruit. And what I love in, in Japan, you see persimmon used a lot in savory applications, not just desserts and pastries like here. And so I'm super excited to recreate this salad for my friends. It's um, persimmon shirae, and I'll include the recipe in the show notes, but it's a creamy dressing that doesn't include any dairy on these gorgeous persimmons that these are actually the firm persimmons that you can slice and eat. Um, and then I was also able to get these gorgeous mushrooms from the farmer's market. So chestnut and piopino from Hi-Fi Mycology. We're going to broil these and use them in a miso soup along with the green onion. Um, and then this kale, beautiful kale. I personally love kale. A lot of people think it's too healthy tasting, but one of my favorite ways to prepare it is to grill it so that it really breaks down the fibers and gives it a nice smokiness. Um, and we're going to use this kale grilled as part of a warm salad with carrot and parsnip kimpira, which is a Japanese stir fry. The carrots and the parsnips, I just cut into thin matchsticks and am doing a nice saute with some um, just sake, salt, sugar, and water. And this recipe I'll make sure to include in the show notes because it is a must have for Japanese home style cooking. Um, it's one of those recipes that you can make ahead of time and let come to room temperature and it's even better. So that's what we have going here. Um, and then in this double lidded donabe, I've started the rice. So it's a um, simple Japanese white rice. We're gonna use this as the base with uh, salmon, the warm kale salad with kimpira, miso soup, and the persimmon salad. And that's gonna be our complete menu for tonight. So I'm gonna take you step by step. The next thing is the preparing the mushrooms in this broiler for the miso soup. All right, so to prep these mushrooms, we're gonna just pile them over here onto this sheet tray. I'm actually just gonna drizzle them with a little oil, season simply with salt, and broil them. Um, and then, I'll show you how simple it is to make this miso soup. I know that one of my friends, especially Jenny, this is for you, th thinks that miso soup sounds intimidating. It's not, it's so simple, and I can't wait to show you just how simple it is. Um, a lot of Americans, my friend Jenny included, feels like cooking Japanese food at home is pretty intimidating. And, you know, I think that with rightfully so, there's quite a few components that come into it and the ingredients can be unfamiliar. Um, and so it's maybe a little bit interesting, you might say, that a Texan like me is making a Japanese home style dinner for her friends here in Austin. Um, but I came about loving Japanese home style food in a really kind of happenstance way um, when a good friend of mine uh, and I started volunteering at a vegetable farm here in Austin. This is in my early 20s. Um, it just so happened that we were getting paid in vegetables. My friend is, having grown up in the countryside of Japan, 
um, would invite me over to her apartment after we got finished working on the farm and we would cook up all the vegetables for the week. And um, bit by bit, week by week, I was introduced to one recipe after another, one amazing way to use vegetables that I'd never thought of. And um, that was how I got my first curious glimpse into Japanese cooking. And I had then uh, pursued a culinary degree at the Natural Epicurean, which is a health-focused culinary school focused in uh, more Eastern traditions, as well as um, my friend Naoko encouraged me to go actually live in Japan. So at that point, I was about 26 years old. And I lived in the countryside of Japan with her family and uh, had one of the most formative experiences of my life. And it's pretty much set my trajectory, my professional trajectory of having started here in Austin, a restaurant and catering called Bento Picnic, um, where I focus in home style Japanese cooking. And um, at the moment, I'm taking a little sabbatical, so I don't have the shop open for you to come and eat right this second. But I do have um, a cookbook proposal in the works for you, as well as a blog that I'm updating with recipes. and I looking forward to sharing more with you soon. All right, so we're gonna set this for 10 minutes. The mushrooms in the broiler should be perfect right after that. We're just gonna ladle it with the hot broth and that will be perfect. I got carried away telling that story and we only have an hour left. So I'm gonna have Charlie come and help me cut these persimmons for the salad. And then um, I'll show you how we do the miso soup and the kale and the salmon. Charlie, if you don't mind. Well, if you know Austin, you know Barton Springs. It was a Wednesday after work about two years ago and we had both gone to just cool off and uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend. So in the age of online dating, miraculously, we met totally organically. I'm just cutting these onions on a bias so that they're ready to go into the miso soup. Um, as soon as those mushrooms come out so that we can just set and forget the miso soup. Already you can see that this carrot parsnip kampira, I'm going to cut the heat on it. It is literally perfect. Um, and then I also cut the heat on the rice and I'm just going to leave that double lidded donabe to set so that none of the heat escapes and it'll also be the perfect temperature for when we turn our attention to plating. Okay, so we went ahead and moved the kimpira and the rice to the back burner for now, since those are both completely done. And we're gonna turn our attention to um, getting the broth ready for the miso soup. I already sliced up the onions for it, and we're just gonna get those portioned into each of our little soup cups here. And then the mushroom should be done at any moment. Charlie is a whiz at getting things ready back here. He already finished the persimmon, so I'm gonna have him help me portion out the mushrooms into the soup cups while I finish the broth. Um, so the broth is here. I'll show you, it's already in this adorable donabe, polka dot donabe that we just got and we're obsessed with. The broth is um, simmering here. This is actually, um, for our friends who are vegetarian, this is gonna be the broth that we share with them. So this is a shiitake and kombu based broth. Um, you'll notice we have three friends who are vegetarian, so we pulled three of these little black soup cups so that when time comes to share the um, finished product with our friends, we know which ones are the bonito and which ones are the vegetarian. Just a little tool of the trade. I worked for years in the service industry, so I'm always kind of trying to think ahead and just really honestly figure out how to make things as easy on myself as I can. <laughs> Even if I'm working, I like to have a good time. So I don't want to put myself into a position where I'm going to be overly stressed. And so this is a really good example. It's an hour before my friends are here and I'm what I'm doing is just getting the broth ready so that when they come, all I have to do is ladle it right over the green onion and mushrooms that are prepped in the cups. And I'll be able to serve them a perfect cup of miso soup. Um, so 
This is something that I wanted to show you because miso, if you just try to mix it in directly into the pot, is gonna be all globby. And so what you wanna do is put a little bit of miso in your ladle and then make um, sort of um, a bit of a dilution so that by the time that it comes into the broth, it's already beautifully incorporated and you're not gonna get any lumps in that miso soup. Julia Child says, never apologize for your food and I would agree. Cooking is really um, something that is an art in and of itself and there's so many factors, you never know quite which way it's gonna go. Um, it's really important ultimately, ultimately at the end of the day that you're, you're present and you're able to enjoy what it is that, that you've created. Um, whether it's exactly what you had in mind or not, the fact is that this is what's in front of you and, to, and your friends are there to join you. And so to just really be able to take a step back, have a deep breath and enjoy. What I wanna do next is bring you guys to show you the grilled kale and the seared salmon. I'm gonna just set this back over here. Um, again, all of my burners are off. And so that's where I want them uh, because by the time I come back in, um, everything will be at that perfect temperature and I can just go ahead and start plating. Um, Charlie is gonna portion the mushrooms into the cup bowls while we go outside to do the grilling of the kale and searing of the salmon. So if you wanna come with me. I'm getting situated over here at my grill station. Um, this is where in the cast iron, I'm gonna sear the crispy skin salmon. And then I'm gonna also get a nice char on the kale. So part of living in a small house is that, um, that Charlie really had the foresight is to kind of expand the kitchen space so that we're also able to make use of this beautiful gas grill uh, and countertop. And so for this kale, which I'm gonna get started with first, you can see I left the stems on. This is literally one of the easiest ways to prepare kale. And I'm just gonna lay it out over my preheated grill so that it just gets turns into this nice bright green and has some nice charred bits and it doesn't take very long at all um, so part of japanese menu design is having five colors five tastes and five cooking techniques so you can see um, that you're going to see that in tonight's menu for sure we have the bright green of the kale this salmon that I prepped by marinating with just some sake and salt um, is done on a cross section and portioned out already so that it's gonna be just super presentable um, and also honestly just super easy to, to manage and cook without having it fall apart on you. Um, all right, so this batch of kale is done. What did I tell you, it goes so fast just gonna move it over to my clean sheet tray here and then do my next batch. As I mentioned before, you know, kale gets a bad rap, but when you prepare something well and really treat it um, in a way that honors what's going on with it, in this case, long, you know, fibrous strands, um, it can be something that's just so enjoyable and so surprising. And that's one of the things that I love to do with my cooking is surprise people of saying like, oh my gosh, I didn't think that I liked kale or I didn't think I liked tomatoes, but you, you know, you, you did it. You, 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 you won me over. And so that's really my, one of my goals in especially preparing um, these vegetables that I love is to win people over. Awesome, this is perfect. You can see it's still bright green in places, but it's also got a nice char. Oh my gosh, that's gonna be so good. Okay, and now we're gonna turn our attention to the salmon. Um, you can see the oil is glistening, so it should be 
simmering. I have this small piece that I'm gonna see if it's, yep, if it sizzles, it's ready. So we're gonna put it um, skin side down so that we get a nice sear on the skin first. And you can see, I pulled it out of the marinade before um, bringing it over to the grill and I dried it off really well because what we're trying to do is get crispness. And it, if um, there's any moisture there at all, it's just going to um, kind of simmer instead of fry. And what we want is a good sear. Okay, so why are we doing this outside on the grill in a pan when we could be doing it inside? A couple of reasons. One, it's a really nice day outside. And I already shared with you that I wanna make things as fun and enjoyable for myself as I can. So that's one of the big reasons. Another reason is it makes the clean up a lot easier. Um, so basically it's to say you have some oil splattering outside on the grill not a big deal. Inside, gonna take more to um, get that cleaned up. But by all means, if you do not have an outdoor grill set up like this, you can absolutely, you know, make some crispy skin salmon perfectly over your indoor range. As well as, honestly, you could sear the kale in a, in a cast iron pan as well. And that's gonna be just as good. In fact, I've done that um, many a times myself. So as we get a nice golden sear on the skin, I'm just turning it around so that it gets some char on the pink sides too. And you can see that because it's been cut into these portion sizes already, and it also has the cure from the marinade, it's holding together beautifully. This is not um, a tricky dish to execute on. It really, it really wants you to cook it. It really just is offering itself up to you at this point. This is actually a very traditional Japanese way of preparing salmon. What's funny, you may not believe me, is that this is often you see part of a Japanese breakfast. And so while, you know, it may seem like too early for a filet of fish for a lot of Americans, this is something that you would oftentimes in the nicest hotels fine on a breakfast buffet. Um, and so uh, that was how I was first introduced to it. I frankly, I love it any time of day. So, and I know most of my friends would prefer to have it in the evening rather than the morning. So we're making it for dinner. The salmon really is gonna depend on the heat of your range, how quickly. So this heat on the outdoor range is a little more diffused. And so it's gonna take closer to 10 minutes to get a nice char on all the sides. But on the indoor range, it is quite a bit more intense, the heat. And so that takes less than five minutes. But really you're going by, um, you can see if you come close, you're wanting to see some nice char um, and the crispy skin. And as soon as you see that, you know, the pieces are cut so um, small that really you don't need to worry about doneness through the middle. They're gonna, it's gonna be perfectly cooked all the way through. So when you're buying salmon, there's a couple things that you wanna look for. Um, you wanna look for the integrity of the flesh. Sometimes when that filet is made, it can be handled a little rough. And you know, when they're pulling the pin bones out, it can be really pulled apart. Um, and that kind of will inhibit your ability to make this as nice of a presentation. So integrity of the flesh. Also to get this crispy skin, first of all, you wanna make sure that the skin doesn't have scales on it. And it is way easier to go ahead and ask them to do that for you at the um, grocery store to go ahead and scale the skin than it is to do at home. Most home cooks don't have the, the tool for scaling the salmon. And so those are two things to look out for, the integrity of the flesh and to make sure that for skin on salmon, the scales are taken off. Okay, so this took all of 15 minutes at the most out here, grilling the kale and searing the salmon. So now this is something that we can check off our list 
and um, head back inside to see how Charlie's doing setting the table. Sometimes things need a little feminine touch. How's it going in here, Charlie? It's all about ready. Ew! Love it. Yeah, so setting the table, we love to do that before guests arrive, just so we're not having to like kind of navigate and do that once they're here. And usually it's like we want to be able to focus on any last minute touches we need to do with the food. Um, and we're not big on name tags. Our only rule is like we just don't let couples sit next to each other. Um, and because Land's doing more bento style today, um, a lot of times we would serve more family style, but today it's all small dishes. It'll all be plated. Um, and so just kind of an assortment of dishes that we've picked up from our travels and all over the place. We don't put uh, all the glassware on the table because we'll set up a little drink station for people when they come in so they can grab drinks, grab a little appetizer, and then they just bring their drink to the table. Sometimes we assign that to a guest. You know, everybody likes to come in and say, oh, what can I do to help? And it's nice to have a little task for them to do um, and keeps them, especially if we're a little behind, it gives them, gives us a little more time. So after dinner, we usually clear everything out. People might still be sitting around and we'll pull out an after dinner game. Um, one of our favorites is the mind. Um, and it really just, if anybody's feeling a little quiet, like it just gets everybody involved and talking and laughing. The very first date Charlie ever invited me on, he cooked for me here. And we sat in this little corner like two lovebirds. It was so sweet. Mm -hmm. He's really, really romantic. Charlie's specialty is Thai cooking. And he made me an amazing Thai meal. So this shirae dressing, shira means white and ae means to mix. And so this is traditionally a tofu based dressing. Um, that you see a lot in Japan that gets used on all different fruits and vegetables. I, for my shirae, I added some hydrated sunflower seeds and just a dollop of olive oil so that it may, turned it into a creamier dressing as opposed to sometimes shiraes you see are kind of like a crumbly dressing where um, uh, I, I prefer the, the emulsified because um, it just feels a little bit more refined. And also I keep a pack of these gloves handy because again, um, in food service, it's just so nice to be able to keep your hands clean, but move quickly through a task. And so I like to have those on hand for, you know, when I'm preparing food for my friends. We have a handful of different sake for our friend to try tonight. Um, I love offering sake with um, a dinner because unlike wine, it's low or no acidity and zero tannin. And so it really doesn't require as precise of pairings and sakes go really well with a wide variety of food. Um, and in fact, because they all have different flavor profiles in and of themselves, um, they're all gonna bring out different qualities and characteristics. So whereas one may bring out the sweetness of the persimmon, the other may bring out the smokiness of the dashi. And um, for my friends tonight, I'm gonna invite them to sip and sample across all of these four sake and decide which one's their favorite. Um, and so I can get their feedback on that. Um, and then I also whipped up a little mocktail. So this one is called Amazake, which translates to sweet sake. And it's that very first step of making sake, um, adding in the culture to the rice and letting it um, just ferment about, you know, uh, a week or so, and it's before any of the sugars have turned into alcohol. And so you still get a really nice fermented rice flavor um, without any of the alcohol, and it's sweeter. Um, so what we did to kind of balance out the sweetness is add some fresh yuzu as well as lemon, and that's a, a easy mocktail that you can just batch up ahead of time. What we're gonna do is just shake it over ice um, and pour it. Charlie's got these really gorgeous glasses that we're gonna um, serve them in. So Charlie's 
bringing over all of the glassware so that as soon as our friends arrive, we can start pouring some drinks for them and, you know, make sure that we get the party started right. You know, it's a Japanese tradition that you wouldn't pour sake for yourself. Um, and it is actually considered bad luck to pour sake for yourself. And so we're going to make sure to, to pour the glasses for our friends tonight. Um, I, I really, I don't know all the lore around why that superstition got started. Um, but I do, what I love about not being able to pour your own sake is that it really encourages this sort of attention to your friends who you're spending time with and sharing a meal with and that you might take turns and pour each other a drink. Um, it's just that kind of extra little specialness that I love. Okay, our friends are arriving any minute now and I do like to have a little bit of theater and that I still wanna be plating dinner when they're arriving. Um, it's one of the things that even though I'm not gonna be actively cooking, I can still kind of be in motion and show that there's not just like food that's been sitting on the table for who knows how long. Um, and so what I want to have ready by the time that they arrive is this snack spread. And that way they um, have a little something to nibble and delight in um, while I finish the plating. And so for the snacks, what we have is a um, cream cheese dip with some um, white miso, sweet white miso. And then we have the cucumber as well as pink radish pickles. And this is a, a unique thing that we actually brought back from Japan. I'm super excited to see how people respond to it, but it's a pickle made with burdock root. And it's got this really toothsome, interesting texture to it. Um, and so again, with all the colors, we're gonna get a full rainbow on this snack tray for them, along with some nice crisp with these tamari um, rice crackers. You know, I'm arranging everything so that um, it really invites people to make their way around the tray um, in pockets. So you could say it's a little bit of a bento style that everything kind of has its own place in the tray and um, those those pockets of color just really pop. I um, am finishing up the this appetizer spread. Charlie has um, just went to grab some ice because we love to have um, just a bucket of sparkling water set up on the way in so that our friends can help themselves to a water before they even come in the door. They have a refreshment. Um, and it also, as you can see, we have limited space. We don't like to to clutter it, a small space can feel cluttered really quick. So having sparkling waters on the front porch is a great way to greet our guests. Okay, our friends are just arriving and just in time we have all of our snacks spread, spread set up as well as our sake, our mocktail, and Charlie's just pulling the edamame off the stove. So we are ready. Oh, thank you. We'll probably bring it back for lasagna, but thank you. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Come in, come in. Oh, beautiful. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Doing thank you for so having well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yes. Guys, so much for coming.
So we're just about ready. We have all of the dishes plated and set. The one last thing we're gonna do is um, ladle the miso soup so that that goes on as a hot component. And then we'll invite our friends to come sit down. This is the miso broth. Miso does settle, so you just wanna give it a nice stir before ladling it on top of the soup. And, um, you know, I always have friends asking how they can help. This is one area where I'm gladly going to accept some help. I'm gonna ask Kelsey to go ahead and bring each one of these over to the table. And then as soon as all the soups are set, we'll invite everybody to come sit down. I can't, it's tricky. I have to enlist someone because I can't pour it myself. Oh yeah, that's a good way to make a friend. <laughs> Which one did you say was there with the person? The Bride of the Fox. Oh, that's this is that last piece. That's so cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for coming. You can start with the miso soup while it's nice, piping hot still. Um, I do like to sip it and then use the chopsticks to eat what's there, but there is a small spoon there if you would like to use Thank a spoon. You. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. Mm -hmm. In your bowl, that's what I would have next is kind of work your way around the bowl. There's rice, a grilled kale salad, parsnip and carrot kimpira, and then the salmon with um, wasabi furikake or avocado. And um, this is kind of like a savory foray into persimmons. Mm. So I had multiple times in, in when I was when we were in Japan just now, um, persimmon shirai. It's a salad made with tofu. Shira means white and a means to mix. And so it's like a white dressing that's dairy free. And I also added in um, sunflower seed into the dressing itself to make it more creamy and then as a topping. But yeah, so y'all enjoy. Thank Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.